welcome Tracy Stackhouse. Um, I'm so excited that you have come to be on the podcast today. I know we're going to have some amazing information to share with our, our listeners. Um, so I'm going to have Tracy introduce herself and give a little bit of background. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to give our listeners a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be covering today. Um, some people might have heard Tracy um, speak before she provides a presentation in the remote delivery CERT program for safe and sound protocol practitioners. And it was based on that that I really wanted to have her on the podcast because she just does such a beautiful job of merging theories that many of us practitioners have worked from and blends that with um, polyvagal theory and then really provides um, a very clear framework about how we then now merge these theories to help support implementation of safe and sound protocol. But I want our, for our listeners to know that this information is not just about supporting the safe and sound protocol outcomes. It's, it's really what we need to be embedding in, in our day-to-day -day practice um, as well. So we're in for a good one today. So please, Tracy, just give us a little bit of background, um, who you are, your clinical frameworks. Sure. Thank you so much, Joanne. What a lovely, um, I'm, I'm glad that the uh, presentation that I was able to do for the remote cert certification for SSP was useful for you. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk with you and, and with everybody to make this information accessible. So I'm a, I'm a pediatric occupational therapist in Denver, Colorado. Um, so I, I have a background in developmental neuroscience. My master's degree is in developmental psychology and developmental cognitive neuroscience from the University of Denver. And I'm an OT uh, prior to that and always intended to practice as an OT, even though I studied psychology um, and neuroscience. And I, I just love occupational therapy. I think it's um, a really extraordinary profession. And I, every day I work a little bit here or there, either clinically or working on different trainings that I provide. And I tend to revisit our core theories as an OT pretty frequently, just because I'm often thinking about them or writing about them or trying to figure out how to share them. And I always find myself feeling so lucky to be an occupational therapist. So I, um, I think that our theory base, the way that we approach looking at Occup human occupation, how people operate and engage and adapt in their everyday life is a really treasure trove of um, kind of humanity and wellness and wholeness. And I love that about our, our field. I also think that the way that we can bridge when there's a struggle, when there's difficulty into the wholeness of a person's life and really help find the best way forward are things that are so valuable about our profession. And so anyway, I just, I kind of feel every day very lucky to be an OT. Um, and so I run a nonprofit organization in Denver uh, that's been here for about 18 years now, Developmental FX. And before that I worked uh, primarily at the Children's Hospital in Denver as a pediatric OT and as the clinical specialist in sensory integration. So in our field of occupational therapy, we have all of these different theory bases to draw from, but my grounding is really in sensory and motor systems first. And so I have training in uh, neurodevelopmental therapy, MDT, I'm certified in that and worked with Lois Fly as a mentor who continues to be a, a mentor and then um, have spent a lot of time learning different approaches around sensory integration. Air sensory integration is my primary frame of reference there. And I really um, find it to be a rich source of information. I, I, um, every January, we reread parts of the Airs textbooks uh, as a team here and kind of come back and revisit the theory in her birthday month, which sounds maybe like a little over the top, but it's really a beautiful tradition and we really love it. And then I also have a lot of expertise in trauma-informed care and attachment-based work. So 
working more in a space of social emotional development. And all of those really in the neurosciences start to converge around understanding what is regulation. So I would say that I've had a pretty deep journey in trying to understand what is regulation. And some of that's informed by work I've done in the space of fragile X syndrome. So uh, I've developed, uh, I was fortunate to be on the very first clinical team focused on fragile X really in the whole world and worked with Rondi Hagerman, who's my advisor and mentor. And Fragile X syndrome um, has a genetic cause, um, but it creates a range of regulatory difficulties that are kind of prototypes for the kinds of things that occupational therapists first were working on. Dr. Ayers first described defensiveness, for instance, tactile defensiveness and sensory defensiveness. And that's a feature of Fragile X syndrome. Hyper arousal is a feature of Fragile X syndrome. And so I had to really learn what is this on a pretty deep level, molecularly and neurologically. And that was really why I went to graduate school. So I, I think that my kind of coming to the polyvagal world and trying to understand human behavior through that lens is, is, was motivated by trying to really sort out the intensity that happens when you see dysregulation in these systems, whether because of fragile X or because of trauma. And then if you put those two things together, hold on. So I know Dr. Porges has published some in that space and we can talk about that more if we need to later. I like how you bring up um, defensiveness. Um, I recently read a paper, um, and I'm sort of writing in that space for my PhD about those underlying you know, defensive systems in our, in our biology. And it makes sense that we have them. Um, we have them right down to our cellular level for immune systems. And so it makes sense that we have it at a at a more bigger level for our behaviors of when we sort of perceive a threat and triggering different um, defensive systems and having behavioral and biobehavioral responses based on that. So um, yeah, I, I like how you brought, you brought that up. Um, so since you know, we're talking about models, I'm wondering, um, and I know that we have a lot of OTs who do tune in and listen, and many have a framework background in sensory integration or arousal, th arousal theory. And wondering if you could speak to that and how they sort of shift their framework to now layer polyvagal in um, on top of that. Cause I mean, obviously it merges beautifully. Yeah, they absolutely merge beautifully. And I think it's really a matter of just translation and being flexible to understand that the complex the complexities of the regulatory system are such that it isn't just a linear process or a single process and when mo many of us when we learn about arousal theory we kind of use that as our framework so the idea of an arousal theory is uh, aligned to the window of tolerance concepts that Pat Ogden and, and Dan Siegel have, have sort of popularized. Um, and that concept of a window of tolerance uh, situates optimal adaptation and optimal arousability in the kind of center space. And then what happens is that that window has width and dimension to it. Uh, and location, kind of space. And as the constraints are put on the person's ability to adapt, that window uh, can be narrowed down and it can also be shifted in relative location um, with if the kind of boundaries of that are low arousal or even lower than low arousal, sleep states or even coma states, so really deep states of deactivation and then you can move into heightened states of activation and that so if those are the poles of that space our optimal functioning um, kind of situates itself somewhere in the in the mid ranges usually when we're doing when we're adapting well 
And so most of us have that conception of kind of an arousal window or an optimal arousal state that kind of sits in the middle. And then in the work um, in the vagal systems that has been done, you know, from Dr. Porges and also a lot of this work comes from Deb Dana's work. Um, the conception was to take um, a little bit more of an evolutionary view of how um, the system sets you up to operate in that social engagement ventral state. And that that's a state that allows you to have the kind of widest view of the world. So at the top of this uh, kind of metaphorical ladder that Deb Dana often shares um, and is quite useful, I think, in, in helping us to conceptualize what's happening. And as you move um, toward that state, you're going to move from these low dorsal activation through more sympathetic activation up into a ventral state. So sometimes people can get confused because optimal is now at the top instead of in the middle, and it can feel a little bit like, wait, which theory am I using? When in fact, there isn't any need to feel like those are um, not aligned. They aren't visually aligned unless you kind of tweak and move them. So in the SSP talk that I did for ILS, I, I tried to just kind of metaphorically show how in the nervous system, it's really a matter of mathematics and computation and you can just move those states around and get them to align. So, so in the visuals that we kind of have in our mind's eye, um, it can feel like there's a lack of alignment in those two models, but I, I think what's really important for any of a, any clinician or really any, any parent or anybody trying to approach this material is to take the model that you feel like you best understand, because when we're trying to convey a sense of certainty and safety, we need to feel like we can um, articulate what it is that we're trying to accomplish, what is our intention, and be very clear about that. And so if the model feels cluttery or confusing, then that won't serve that purpose. Um, and it doesn't really, I, either model is accurate, and they're both, um, synergistic with each other, the whole system, if we really dive into the regulatory capacity, you know, it's 85% of our neural networks are engaged in this, these systems and they don't all align simultaneously. It's not like you just have one arousal state. Um, even if you're in, let's say that you're in a ventral vagal state and you're feeling socially engageable, but you're feeling kind of relaxed, like you're on the beach and you're sort of chill with your friends and you're just letting the waves lull you. You're gonna be in a fairly low central nervous system state. Um, you're gonna be in a relaxed and bright positive affective state. Um, let's say that you're playing a game of sense rugby, one of my favorite things that happens in Australia. Um, this fun, wonderful kind of therapeutic opportunity, but you're feeling socially engaged, but you're feeling quite energized and intense maybe even. So your affective state, your arousal state aren't gonna just be all in a line. These things don't all line up. And that's the beauty of this system is that it's quite complex and it can hold all this variation of different kinds of arousability. Um, in order to allow us to be fully human and express all of our experience. So it isn't one thing or the other, and it doesn't all line up. And, and in fact, we don't need it to or want it to. Yeah, and I think that's, you said it perfectly. That I know sometimes when people are first learning polyvagal theory, they sort of see it sort of broken up into dorsal, sympathetic, or ventral vagal, and you kind of have these concepts in their mind of people are either in one or the other state that really you know we are very complex beings and very dynamic and it's the interplay of them all together and they're all functioning and they're all online at different times that they kind of move and shift based on those underlying concepts of safety or or, or threat 
Um, mm. So they're all functioning. So dorsal vagal isn't bad. It's right. yeah, it's it's it it's always active in our system and has functions, and it will respond based on our perceptions of threat or or safety. That's right. That's right. I think it's also, you know, because in the polyvagal sense, we think about dorsal often as more of that withdrawal, active state. But, you know, we all need to be in dorsal sometimes. And that system needs to be activated for us in order to allow us to rest and restore and recover and find different um, nuances in that kind of recovery state. So there, like you said, it's not a bad thing. And what happens is it's when the window gets narrow enough that you start to not feel like you're adapting. Um, and when that starts to happen, the vagal system is a powerhouse of thriving, uh, protection and survival. And so you will end up having that dominate what's going on um, in a way that is not open and allowing for all of experience. It's a constraint. It's a constraining system. So whenever we have the modulation systems kick into constraint and protection, um, their job is to do that. And it doesn't allow for the other possibilities. So all of the other systems are going to be constrained by that. But it isn't that they're going to then push everything into alignment around that. Each system has its own regulatory function happening. Mm -hmm. So the grand master on some level is that vagal state. And also on a sensory level, the kind of grand master is really the vestibular system. And so we have these different forces that are telling and organizing and integrating for us. And it's, um, it's beautifully rich and complicated and why we often need to have therapists engaged in the space of the intervention, because these are big systems that have big disruption and often need lots of well-informed guidance in order to, to be addressed well. Mm, exactly, and I know you provide a, a wonderful framework for that. And before we go there, I just wanted to go back a little bit too, because I know in your presentation, when you were talking about the window of tolerance, you gave this really great visual, which for me, I thought made this nice bridge of how you can then talk to, to families and you talked about the river of integration. And so you can really kind of have that river framework in mind and you can speak how, when you can have those forces that will narrow that river and you know, create eddies and restrictions. So there's less movement, less adaptability within that. So I'm going to let you add to what I've just started because uh, I'm sure you've spoken to this more and yeah. Yeah, so, so the river of integration really is, comes from Dan Siegel's work and he talks about how when we're in a flow state. So, you know, Dr. Siegel is a really great translator of lots of sources of information and, and um, there's, I, I would never put myself in the same camp as Dr. Siegel, but that's sort of what I try to do too, is take lots of sources of information. So the idea of flow, a flow of integration is really um, a concept that, you know, Cheecham Holly kind of popularized back in the 1980s, but to talk about this flow state, how flow is organized based on engagement, it's ba and based on safety and based on um, capacity and do and skillfulness. And so when you align all those forces, you get into this really this groove of, of um, everything is kind of cooking and you feel motivated and your affective system allows you to be fluidly engaged and really moving towards something kind of goal oriented in a way. Um, it doesn't have to be a hard goal. It can be kind of just a general, I want to be in this space, but you're moving. And so there's that flow. It's like the river. And when you start to have constraints and bumps in the river, um, the edges, Dr. Siegel talks about how you bump into chaos and rigidity. So that, you know, those are really general terms, but they're so, they're such the lived experience of all of us that as soon as we 
start to feel our flow kind of bumpy um, and the you know edges are coming in and the water's getting faster and we're feeling uh, the torrent of it we can feel like, oh, I'm gonna bump into my edges and my edges might be a bit chaotic or I might dig in and get more rigid and inflexible and narrow in my thinking. So I think that's a, a really helpful concept. It's often before we ever talk about arousal states or the vagal ladder or anything else, I, it's the simplest way to think about it. So often with a new family that I'm working with, a new school teacher in a, in, a, in a program somewhere. I might start with this um, as, because it's, some, it's so relatable for all of us, right? And then you can, once there's a, a general understanding, then you can sort of see how does the child's behavior, the child's lived experience map onto that? Where do we see the rough patches? And how can we start to translate that then into some deeper theory? Um, but I, sometimes I think simple is better and it's nice, it's a nice, uh, nice concept. Yeah, definitely. I definitely made connections for me when, because sometimes it is hard to explain regulation or dysregulation to families and trying to sort of, you know, give a nice strong visual and so they can see the flow and the ebbs and changes and how different events can narrow the river um, or different events can, can widen the, the river so they can have a bit of an idea um, right. to how and to visualize also, that. Yeah, I think it's also interesting where I have very often had conversations with parents where there's a, um, an aha that happens when they start to realize that maybe in moments of dysregulation, their child ends up on the rigid bank, but the parent ends up on the chaos bank. And then you have this mismatch and we're like, really far away from each other because we've got this raging river of what we both want in between us, but we, we can't access it because we're in such different places. And so I think that these words and concepts become really useful when they land in the space of, I get, oh, I get that. And when you see the parent, like, oh, that's exactly our experience or even the child, you know, duh, yeah, I'm feeling that chaos right now. Um, it's so helpful to be able to label it and name it and, and bring it forward into a space of, um, oh, what is that? And what might we do about that? Mm -hmm. And so would then, would you then layer a bit of the science, the polyvagal of understanding autonomic nervous system of what actually might be happening in your body while you're, in that sort of chaotic state? Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, I think once you get that aha, then you can say, let's go a little deeper here and let me help you understand this. And, you know, the individual differences that we know exist for one person, chaos could be that they're sliding really into a full on more sympathetic state, but for somebody else, it could be a different experience than that. So I think, you know, it's really one of the things that I, have learned, um, we all learn this uh, over and over and over again, is to just stop and listen. And one of the things I love about the work that Deb Dana is doing is she's really having people actively listen and tag what they hear into glimmers and triggers. What I love about that is, um, I think, you know, as a clinician, I think I've been a, a decent listener, an active listener, but it is a lesson we learn over and over every day, how to listen and how to listen for the words that are describing that family's lived experience, um, the way that that child is sh showing up in the world. How, what are the words that people are using? And, you know, those words are tagged into the somatosensory sensory system. They're tagged into the affective system. They're tagged into the postural system. And, they're, and that's both through the words that are used, the affect that's used, the posture that's used to express it. Um, and you, so you really, are, you're listening on every level and you're hearing the story of the regulation uh, I think there's a richness there that's really powerful. So sometimes those simpler metaphors bring those stories 
and bring that um, charge that gives you the insight that you need to help them deepen their understanding of what's going on. So I think based on what you said, I think this just leads us perfectly into, okay, so how does somebody actually develop those listening skills? Because as you said, it's not just listening to the auditory, the words, it really is the listening and the observation of the nuances in facial expression and body language and, and the interplay, the, um, and I know this will lead us into you know, the neurobiology of, of interpersonal or interpersonal neurobiology of relationships. And I know because you have such a, um, a strong passion for kind of strengthening the OT world or practitioners world, you know, you definitely try to bring these models, these frameworks, but then add structure to help develop the skill set in, in, in practitioners. So, um, and this, everything we're gonna be talking about now is information that um, not only just supports SSP outcomes, but in your day-to-day -day practice, but for individuals or families who are listening, this kind of knowledge base that we're going to start to discuss are things that you can bring in in the day-to-day -day, um, within your interactions with, with loved ones. And um, I know in, in your presentation, Tracy, that you really talked about um, the, key, the key concepts of to help support outcomes is, is co-regulation. And we know that's all part of polyvagal, that attuned relationships, but you break it down into really specific components. And I'm just gonna sort of, you know, help trigger your, cause you don't have the slide with the information in front of you. You've probably got it in your memory banks, but, um, and have you speak to each, but, you know, you talk about, you know, synchrony, you know, mutual reciprocity, um, mirroring, uh, the serve and return, the shared affect, and the important parts of repair. I wonder if you could speak to to speak to that and and how you actually go through in your trainings to help build those skill sets in practitioners, but then also helping practitioners support families. I know this is a big question here. <laughs> it's a big question. So it's. It, I think the first thing is that it it really starts with with self-awareness mm -hmm. always um, on the clinician's part and in a family system to notice where there's awareness and where there may not because when a family has been living out of that flow of integration there's a lot more day-to-day -day experience in super active coping and that can kind of pull you away from being fully present in the moment because and, you know, so many of the families that I work with, um, they're, when they get into connection, they're deeply, playfully, warmly, uh, in an attuned way, synchronously able to be with. But sometimes giving permission to get there, it, it, you have to like work to even create that opportunity because the stress and just the daily lived experience is so intense that there's a lot of not being fully present. So I think as a clinician, you the first thing you have to do is you have to find that mindful ability to be fully present. And that's a felt experience in our bodies. It's a, a deeply somatic experience to, to be able to be present. Um, and in presence then, you want to be able to bring your eyes to a, a very empathetic sharing of what's going on here. So I think, you know, what you're looking for then, I think the list that you, you, you know, kind of gone through, you're, you're looking for these particular qualities. Um, so synchrony, for instance, interpersonal synchrony has um, a, a neurological foundation in, in mirror neuron systems and in interactive oscillators that allow us to have a shared mutual rhythmicity that just occurs naturally. So when you're really in a regulated available state, that rhythmicity becomes very evident. Um, and you can induce it in another person. 
sometimes when I do trainings with um, clinicians, I have them, you know, just kind of play around with that. Like, can you get another person to hand you something and hand it back? And as you, you know, hand the object and you receive it, can you start to really just play with the timing and the spatial location of that? And how does that feel? And can you disrupt the synchrony and can you enhance the synchrony? Um, any of us can do that. And we all have that kind of interpersonal power. Um, and, but it, it's when you're really available. So people who are more dysregulated are gonna lose synchrony. They lose synchrony rather quickly. Um, and the synchrony is both in their social, I call it the social motor system. Um, but in that, in the motor synchrony, you see this kind of degradation of the, of the rhythm of it and also of the ease of fluidity of exchange. So synchrony is, is very in the social motor, gross motor space, but it's in the fine motor space, in the ocular motor space, it's even in the breath. Um, so what, you, what you're working on really is, is, is fine tuning that exchange um, across those different spaces. And when you have synchrony, it's easier to move into that mutual re reciprocal exchange. If you don't have synchrony, it's really hard to do that. So it's a little hierarchical. If you are working with somebody who's struggling with reciprocity, with the serve return, and they can't quite get it, it's usually because they're missing this element of synchrony. And sometimes they're missing synchrony because synchrony really comes from partly from your own breath cycle. And so sometimes we have to back up and just work on that a little bit. And it also comes from your three-dimensional sense of your body and space. And that, that, of course, neurologically comes from lots of sources. But if I'm working with a therapist trying to improve their symphony, I'm going to have them be really mindful of their breath and really mindful of their body and their rhythm, and then come back again and ground and land themselves and feel their three-dimensional self before they do the interaction. So, uh, so much of it is in that felt sense of their somatosensory body, of their interoceptive body um, and their breath control. Um, so those are, that's a lot of words, um, but uh, hopefully that's making sense. No, perfect, very perfect. And you're so right. And I think um, when I had a conversation with Kim Barthel, she definitely speaks to that to really to be the best advocate for your clients or even your family members that really it's just yourself that you need to be able to work on because that through that interpersonal neurobiology impacts the self of the other or the autonomic state of, of the other. So the more in tuned you can be into yourself, into how you regulate your own autonomic state, how you can you know, maintain or, or use therapeutic use of self from body, body posture to facial expression is what is going to help regulate the other people who you have in your life that you're working with or supporting. Yeah, very yeah, nice. Yeah. But I like how you, you break it down and it really is those, those components that you, that you speak to. Yeah, I think there's also, yeah, a, an interesting nuance that I've learned because of working with a lot of people with fragile X syndrome. And that is that um, you know, I, I can bring about a sense of regulation with most people fairly rapidly, I would say. But one of the things that's really important to remember is that my window of tolerance, I need to be in my window, of I need to be really available and present and fully regulated first. But the goal isn't for the other person to match me, it's for me to go to their optimal. And I think that that takes an extra sense of knowing that you have to be present enough to know yourself, but then to tune into them. And for them, what feels safe could be nothing to do with your 
sense of synchrony of the world. Right? So where, where do they feel safe? Where do they organize around? Where is their window of tolerance located? And sometimes for some of our individuals that we work with, their best optimal state is way faster than mine, where I feel the most grounded and centered. But in that moment, it's not about me. I have to stay grounded, but I have to meet them. And that, that is tricky. And one of the things that I shared in the um, SSP talk was, you know, I, I, I found it extremely useful to rate a child's state, maybe on the vagal ladder, for instance, and to simultaneously rate where the parent is and to really highlight that, to bring to a lot of clarity, when the child is here, where are you? And what happens to your nervous system? And then what's the goal for the child and what's the goal for you? And how are we gonna you know, manage both of those things simultaneously? That is um, really, really, really important. And the goal isn't, like I said, you regulate to me, it's me regulates where you function well, and then we're gonna proceed together. So I think those are important um, concepts that really can move the, the interventions along more quickly when we, when we really think about how those things work together in a very dynamic system. And I think this information is so important because I know when we talk about um, setting up the environment for the safe and sound protocol, we definitely talk about you know, decreasing other external distractions, um, having the parent you know, leave electronics out of sight of the room, and we tell the parent that you're just going to be present and take their child's lead. And often they're not really sure how to actually, um, well, what does that, what does that mean? And I think you said too, a really important um, lead into this is, is the parent giving themselves permission to be 100% present. Um, I know I found um, in, my, in my study that I'm doing as part of my, my PhD, um, obviously you, being a PhD, you have very you know, tight constraints. You can't, you have to take your therapist hat off a little bit and everyone has to kind of have a similar, similar experience. So, in part of my product, part of my setup was that families um, knew the criteria and it was really about the environment, you know, that you're gonna leave your phone in the hot, in the in your car, um, you know, you're gonna come in. And I would say, you know, just allow yourself to have a time of forgetting your day to day and and be present with your child, sort of take their lead if they're and I would sort of say if they're gonna do a puzzle, if they select to do a puzzle, then you could be there with. Um, and the feedback that I had from families, initially it was just in the beginning, you could see how they were just like having to get comfortable with not thinking about their other agenda and not having the phone in their, in their bag with them. And then over the, the protocol, you could see them start to relax once they've accepted that to actually try and be with their child. But I think because life is so busy uh, and we're always told to do do particularly if you're working with children um, who have special needs you go to therapy and you're always being told do this work on that do on that 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 it's hard to actually let all that go and just work on really being present and what does that mean and it is a lot of work um, to do that and I don't think people and um, I think you speaking to some of these components really let us know things that we take for granted, but sometimes we really do have to dissect that to help people tune into it, to, to build that with those, those connections um, with families. Absolutely, absolutely. It's also, um, it's like, even if you're present in the moment and mm -hmm. then some time passes, whatever that time may be, two minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. And then you have a little shift where you take a deep breath, you may even shut it, even magnetic energy. And, and then you realize, oh, I really needed that. And now I really do feel present. So presence deepens. And as presence deepens, possibility opens. So one of the things that I think happens is 
Um, you know, across the time of treating in SSP, for instance, that repeated experience of coming back to presence and really staying in those moments together, the, by the third or fourth day, um, the experience of what does that mean to my nervous system as the parent might be really different than how it felt on the first day. So one of the things that I think is really lovely is to have repeated conversations about that. And um, what, what is your experience of the child now that you really have a deepened experience of presence with them? And how does that open your sense of what their life is like and how you might play with them and how you might follow their lead? It changes as we become more deeply regulated and more deeply engaged. So I love that process. And I think it, um, it's a really deeply honest thing to be able to give up your phone and stay present and then say, I don't actually want the phone back because I love this so much. <laughs> or I need to retreat. What does that mean? I wish that I could retreat. What does that mean? So I think all of those things are part of the process. And, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that is exactly what, at the end of um, my you know, research and I was sort of doing post data collection and just having a discussion with the families about what their experience and so many of the parents shared how nice it was for themselves to kind of have that experience of, of, of letting everything go and just being with their child. And they sort of said, I didn't realise actually just how fun sitting doing a puzzle was or colouring was with with my child and we've started to, um, I realized it's actually good for me. And so we've actually started to do some of these more activities at, at home. And um, so that was nice to hear that. Cause I think, I think, you know, life is so busy that, that we need to realize the importance of, you know, people call it downtime, but um, it's sort of non-pressured connect time, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, the goal of that, sustained ability to be in social engagement for the purpose of connection is the richness that's available to us in connection. Um, so letting ourselves be enriched by that and informed by that, what a cool thing. I love that you're doing that in your work and asking those questions and probing into that. Because, um, you know, connection begets regulation, but regulation begets deeper connection and it's that reciprocal dance that's happening in that system that um, is what all it's what it's all about mm -hmm. and I think this segues perfectly into next when you talk about in the training of you know around clinical reasoning and you talk about like the the R's you know regulate relate and reasoning and that they're not always in you know, the decision making about where to actually start. Do we start with relate or do we start with, um, with regulate? So yeah, talk to us about that. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that, the, that having the list of ours um, is really important and, and not being in chaos or rigidity around how you're using the R's, staying in a flow, staying in connection, staying in reading what does this child or, or what do I need right now? And it may be different from moment to moment. Um, so when we establish a base of safety, for some individuals getting there, if you try to do it relationally first, they're not open yet to relationship. And, you know, we work with individuals who've had all different kinds of experiences, sometimes quite significantly awful experiences, where a sense of relationship takes a bit of time. And so for individuals like that, sometimes you have to start with a lot of regularity and predictability and, and work through other regulation sources um, in order to open the possibility that relationship matters. Now, of course, you're doing this with them. So it's never really in the absence of relationship, but the, the focal quality, the focal intention, you might have to soften. Um, and it's sort of fascinating to me that, in, again, going back to individuals with fragile X syndrome, 
One of the things uh, that's characteristic of people with fragile X is that when their arousal system starts to rise, not even into hyperarousal yet, not even into a not ventral state, but what you'll see is that they'll start to soften their eye gaze. And sometimes it becomes pretty intense, pretty fast. They'll get very actively gaze avoidant. And so in those moments, if I impose my relational energies, that I'm only going to escalate their need to withdraw. But if I realize that I need to infuse a sense of safety through rhythm and, and predictability and a little softer relational energy and allow them to initiate the relationship with me, then that creates that opportunity in that platform. So it's again following the lead, but not at the exclusion of what's my intention and goal. Um, I know that what I want is a, a rich connection, but I'm not gonna get it if I impose it. So it's really those R's, you have to be fluid with them moment to moment. And sometimes you start, you know, usually because we know again with a Dan Siegelism, you know, with the kind of flip the lid of, philosophy that we are going to go to reason first usually especially with any dysregulation but the other two primary r's of relate and regulate those two are very fluid and there isn't um, a rule so i think in you know perry's work he talks about a neurosequential model um, but even in his work the neurosequential isn't it is must follow this order it's what is indicated by what, what is presented to you. So you have to be pretty fluid with that um, and then move into higher level reasoning and repairing and restoring and the other R's that are available once you know that regulation and relationship are solid. Mm -hmm. Lovely. So I know you developed a model to help practitioners develop this skill set. Uh, and you're about to release an updated of, of that model. So if you could just speak a little bit about the STEP SI and then what uh, the new model, because there's going to be practitioners who are listening, who are like, wow, I want to learn more about what Tracy's speaking about. So, so yeah, let, it, let everyone know. Yeah, thanks so much for, um, you know, I think this is a lovely forum to let people know about that, but I, for me, clinical reasoning allows you to offer yourself fully and wholly and present and be fully present. So, because it gives you um, more surety about what it is that you're doing. So, in the reflective planning time, having tools that really structure your thinking and allow you to to try to um, identify the key elements of intervention that are gonna align with the system that you are working with this person, this wonderful being, um, that to me has been kind of a, a passion for me. So in the 1990s, um, I was working with Julie Wilbarger and Sharon Trinnell at the Children's Hospital in Denver. And together we developed a tool called the STEP SI um, it's a tool that stands, it's a mnemonic that stands for the elements of intervention that you use, sensation, task, environment, predictability, self-regulation, and interaction. So we use the word interaction instead of relationship just because it was an I and um, it lent itself to the step SI mnemonic. Um, so it's grounded back in an heirs SI theory and that tool we developed as a fidelity to treatment tool for a research study that we did with Lucy Miller. Um, and that was a study of sensory modulation disruption. So that tool has been around for a while, you know, quite a, quite a number of years now. And it's really lent itself to clinicians all over um, finding a way forward in terms of both their own treatment planning, but also assessment and consultation models where you can really think through if a child, so if the model, the step SI model was developed to address sensory modulation and regulation problems. So you would identify that regulation profile and then 
use STEPSI to, to enrich and elaborate your treatment intervention plan. Um, when we first developed it, there was uh, such a focus on sensation as the agent of, of support. Um, and what we realized in, in analyzing intervention was that it's really all of the elements that you bring to bear and to varying degrees for any particular child. So you have a lot of richness in what you offer as, an, in, as a therapist, not just sensation. And in fact, sensation alone isn't the, the cornerstone. They're all woven together into this fabric that creates the opportunity for shifting. So the newer model that's an update of the Step SI is still has the Step SI in it. We've added an extra P. So it now includes playfulness as its own dimension. So it has STEP squared SI. Um, and, but it's tied back not just to sensory modulation issues. Now we have a tool called the SPIRIT and the SPIRIT is another an acronym that stands for Sensory Processing Integration Reasoning Interactive Tool. And this is a tool that allows you to look at the sensory disruptions that individuals can have, but not just sensory modulation. There are other kinds of sensory disruptions that individuals can have. Um, so, uh, and then it also looks at affective disru disruptions and motoric disruptions. And it looks at those in a pretty fine grained way, um, integrating in social, emotional and self development and also executive functioning um, elements. So it's a pretty comprehensive tool, but it allows you to really create a roadmap of what, what is needed and where am I headed? So, so that tool, um, we're working on uh, launching a training platform on it in April of 2021. So it'll um, be available through an online platform through, we're calling that program, the Learning Journeys Program. Um, and so it'll be available through that platform. Amazing. So we'll put a link in, in the show notes so our listeners can, can find that uh, also, and I'm assuming because this is all going to be talking about regulation, that there will be components of understanding the autonomic nervous system as as, as a strong yeah. basis to that. Absolutely, centrally to it, right? Because without a sense of safety and connection, and that would be a nice basic definition of what does it mean to be regulated. Um, then really the whole rest of the neurodevelopmental system is constrained. Mm -hmm. And that constraint puts edges and uh, effort where, where, where and, and a lack of fluidity mm -hmm. around developmental capacity. So for sure it's, it's at the cornerstone, it is the cornerstone. Um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about all different elements of how regulation functions and, and what you might do about it. So I think that's also really important, what you might do about it. You, you know, how do you use SSP in an integrated way? How do you use any of our tools in a way that really promotes regulation in the long term so that somebody isn't stuck and struggling and um, not able to really manifest the wholeness of themselves in a way that feels comfortable and and easeful and generative. Those are the things that we hope for. Well, it sounds like an amazing tool. Yes, very helpful to people. So everyone's gonna to need to check that out. Absolutely. So we used it as a, a, the Fidelity tool at Camp Jabiru in Australia. I was um, just about to say, I said, I know you have connections here in Australia. So please um, share about those. So yeah, so tell us all about Camp Jabiru. Yeah, so Camp Jabiru is sort of the brainchild of Colleen Hacker and uh, Lynette Burke now also, are they're the co-directors and they have a clinic in um, Richmond in New South Wales, but it's called the Sensory Gym and, and Camp Jabiru runs out of that, um, out of their clinic and it's a, it's a kind of a passion project for many of us um, who come and, and support the camp as master clinicians who are supporting it's kind of a learning environment for all of the therapists who go. There's a formal practicum program involved. 
and then 100 plus children who are there every day for a week. And it's just this incredible um, kind of environment where we're implementing interpersonal neurobiology every moment in nature, uh, in play, in you know, risk-taking challenge with children, in, in pure joy, in pure challenge. Um, in daily life and just kind of really living the whole of it. And it's a beautiful experience. So we've been doing some research on that. Shelley Lane, um, who's a professor who is uh, at the University of Newcastle and now back in the United States at Colorado State University has been really instrumental in getting that research to coalesce. Hannah Burke um, is a graduate student who is uh, a genius and is uh, really central to that project. and. Carolyn Healy and Beth Austin are also involved in addition um, to, to Colleen and Lynette. So this project brings together a lot of people with a lot of background and knowledge and it just um, seams it together. And there are clinicians from all over Australia who've benefited from participating um, on one level or another in Camp Jabiru. So it's a place where we kind of spread the dandelion seeds as we say, where we really help people, you know, come into the, the fullness of themselves as a clinician and then really be able to, to practice that and, and in a community of learning um, so that it really percolates out of there in a beautiful way. So it's a, it's a very cool project and um, uh, yeah, well, thanks for letting me share a little bit about it. Oh no, because I know that, um, so our listeners know Tracy and I sort of connected last week just to have a little sort of get to know each other. And so we talked about some of the topics that we're covering today. And, and so when Tracy was sharing about Camp Jabiru, I was like, oh my gosh, you need to include this. And because I know when we talked about it last week, we definitely sort of delved a little deeper and, and we sort of said how you, you include the layers of polyvagal and, and that all about the, the boundaries of safety and, and and people understanding that. So that was um, an important layer I wanted to add. Absolutely, it's really critically important. And I think, you know, as a clinician, um, if you have a child out in the middle of the, you know, bush somewhere who's having a hard time figuring out how do I create a sense of safety here, uh, stretches you. And if you have something like the STEPSI that you can sort of tick through in your head, um, it helps you to say, okay, I need to problem solve this uh, because it's not always automatic and natural. And we deepen the automaticity and naturalness of what we bring as a therapeutic agent through knowing more. And that's where clinical reasoning really supports us to become better and more efficient and effective and just more present, which is, is then the conduit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that sounds amazing. Now, I know that was a long time since, obviously, um, I recall, but I remember years ago, isn't there a camp in the US? Camp Avanti, Camp Avanti? Were you involved in that camp at all? Or? So Jabber was really modeled after Camp Avanti, and Camp Avanti was started by Pat Wilbarger, and then Julie Wilbarger, her daughter, um, helped to formulate and kind of organize it. And so Camp Avanti... Um, I've never actually been to Camp Avanti, but so many of my very dear friends and close colleagues um, all know each other. Actually, I think even many of the people at Jabiru know each other because of Avanti experiences. Um, Mm. Camp Avanti um, and Camp Jabiru are pretty different from each other, but I think that it was the launch pad and and the model for some of what happens at Jabiru. Um, so yeah, the, and, and these camp experiences, there's been a little bit of research done on Avanti and we're currently working on trying to publish some of the findings that we have from Jabiru where, and, and part of, you know, it's, it's all the layers that come together in a model like that. You have intensity, you have a lot of clear clinical reasoning happening. You have very focal treatment plans um, and you're in a nature setting with really integrated occupational therapy um, woven into the lived daily life there. So it's a very rich, intense experience. And so I guess on some level, we we shouldn't be surprised at the lovely outcomes. Um, And yet it's beautiful to see the statistics come to bear. So it's nice. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing that definitely. 
and I know there's research out there that speaks to um, the effects of nature and as well as having treatment on an intense um, model versus treatment that just goes on years in, year, years out. Um, so yeah, so what was the main data that you were collecting? So um, we used a couple of different tools. One is the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. We had parent-generated goals um, that were measured three months before camp, immediately before camp, post-camp, and then again three months after camp, so that we could have kind of a, a, a sample of, of, you know, is camp actually the thing that's making these shifts, or is it just this maturation or something else? So. And then we um, used the test of playfulness that in the UFMB had developed. Um, and then we have a couple of other convergent tools um, that are more, you know, questionnaire kinds of tools like the brief or the, you know, tools like that. So we're just starting to dive into to looking at those extra tools, but the goals and the playfulness outcomes are really um, compelling and, um, really show the, the power of the intervention. So it's good, yeah. Oh, sounds amazing. So we'll also include a link to the relevant contact people. So practitioners who are listening, who would love to uh, have that as a learning experience, because it sounds amazing, um, that we'll have information in, in the show notes where they can um, access that. And who knows, maybe in a, in a year or so when we're all, and being vaccinated, we can have um, some international people come and be involved in that. It sounds sounds amazing. So I know we're getting close on time, Tracy, and I want to respect your time. But the last thing I wanted you to share is I know you shared with me that you're involved in, in a podcast yourself. And again, another linkage to Australia, that you're teamed up with um, a group um, seed therapy which is out of um, New South Wales also and about to launch it sounds like an amazing clinical tool for practitioners to link in as well so just yeah tell us a little bit about that yeah thank you so much for for letting me share about that because I do think it'll be um, interesting for folks who are listening to this they might be interested in that as in this other podcast as well so this podcast um, is called Spirited Conversations and uh, our sort of subtitle is Engaging and Elevating Pediatric Occupational Therapy. Uh, the podcast is in conjunction with um, Developmental Effects, where I am in, in Denver in the United States, with SEED, the SEED group that, uh, in Orange, New South Wales. And Sarah McGinnis, or Sarah Fleming, is the director there. And I've been doing supervision mentoring with their clinic for a number of years. And we always have these really fantastic conversations and they have a very captivating team. Um, and so Corey Johnston and Michelle Maunder um, felt like it was really worth uh, putting this together to share with other clinicians who maybe didn't have access to that kind of mentoring. So it's not the kind of podcast that um, uh, is, is it, it's really meant for clinicians to dive pretty deep. It's a deep clinical reasoning conversation. And it's just the three of us uh, in the first uh, series of episodes anyway, it's just the three of us kind of talking about our questions with each other about various topics related to sensory processing, related to motor function, related to how kids put the world together. And it's us just kind of wondering about theory and how theory leads us to better intervention. So um, we just have a very organic conversation and it's, um, for us, it's quite interesting. We hope it'll be interesting for other folks as well. And then our intention is that we'll be inviting um, other people to join us in these spirited conversations in the, in the second uh, season. Mm -hmm. Oh, sounds amazing. So to close, do you think in terms of like families or practitioners listening and they're thinking about um, moving through with uh, learning about the Safe and Sound Protocol, do you, do you have any advice that you'd want to share? Yeah, you know, I, 
the first thing that resonates as you ask that question is, I think, especially since, you know, the training that I did for, for ILS around this, um, I get many calls a week um, with people saying, you know, would you just help me to implement this? And I want the one or two or three things to do. And, um, and I feel deeply for how wonderful it is that somebody's reached out. But I also am always like, okay, let's take a deep breath and find a moment of connection to really talk about what does this actually mean? To be able to implement SSP well to me is a pretty deeply clinical process. Um, I think you really want to spend the time to think it through what, what's going on, what are all the layers, what are the layers of support that need to be put in place, what are the skills that your people need to have around you um, to be able to have effective co-regulation available and accessible. And sometimes that in and of itself is a journey. It isn't just a let's start this tomorrow kind of a thing for, for in my experience. And so I think it's um, to connect with somebody that you feel brings the depth of knowledge and trust that you need to help you create a good comprehensive plan. And from that comprehensive plan, when you step into implementing it, the trust and safety will grow because you're being held in this in this. Um, connection of what is the plan and who's the person helping you navigate that plan. So I, I think that doing this intervention in mm -hmm. a related way from the very beginning all the way through is really um, necessary for six, it, it to be successful and for it to have the kind of impact that we know that it can have. Um, so I, I would say that in general, that would be my best advice. 100% oh, agree. Yeah, so well said. And that's part of why I wanted to do these podcasts is to people to really understand the layers that we need to, to add to, to help support clients to be as successful uh, in completing the protocol. So yeah, thank you so much, Tracy, for saying that. Really appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you so much. This has just been a wonderful experience to have you on and to share your knowledge you're so articulate and you just you know speak this theories and this these frameworks so lovely and I think this information will really be really helpful for clients or to, to families um, and to practitioners listening so thanks again yeah well thank you so much and you know you're a conduit of change and I um, just can't thank you enough for letting me be a part of it but um, it's been I've listened to so many of, of your podcasts and I really see, you know, the power of knowledge sharing mm -hmm. and you've, you've done that really effectively. And, and I can't wait to read um, the work you're doing with your research and to, to learn more as you continue along that path. So thank you for what you're doing, Joy. It's really, really important. I appreciate it. So thanks again. And all the information we talked about will be in the show notes. Again, I would like to thank Stacey so much for her time and sharing of such valuable information. To learn more about Tracy's work, please see the show notes that will have links to the different topics that we discussed, such as a link to her podcast, Spirited Conversations. There'll also be a link to Camp Jabaru and to DFX Learning Journeys for educational opportunities that she offers. If you'd like to learn more about the Safe and Sound Protocol in Australia and New Zealand, please contact Integrated Listening Australia. The website is integratedlistening.com.au and for the rest of the world, please contact Unite Integrated Listening at integratedlistening.com.